Got to make it just right. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's History's Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're in our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and we're streaming live on both Facebook and YouTube. If you've not already done so, please silence your cell phones. If you have volunteered before with the department, or if you are interested in learning about volunteer opportunities, tomorrow, August 11th, in this space, we'll have a sort of volunteer fair set up with staff from across MDAH, representing such varied roles as curatorial services and archeology, span to the Eudor Welty House and Garden and the Governor's Mansion. Come and go from 11.30 to two, see the range of volunteer opportunities available, you'll enjoy light refreshments, and you may even take home a door prize. Remember that admission to the museums and special exhibits is free on Sundays. And this Sunday, August 14th at 2 p.m., we'll be showing the Smithsonian Channel documentary, The Green Book Guide to Freedom. Then at 11 a.m. on Thursday, August 18th, Zakia Summers and Timothy Summers will give a gallery talk about the Summers Hotel, which opened here in Jackson in 1944 and was advertised in the Green Book from 1949 to 1966. And the Green Book exhibit upstairs is here through September 25th. Next week's History is Lunch will feature Ben Raines, author of the book, The Last Slave Ship, The Clotilda, The True Story of How Clotilda Was Found, Her Descendants, and An Extraordinary Reckoning. I hope that we'll see you back for that. Today, though, we are delighted to welcome back our friends Kevin Green and Andrew Wiest to present The National Guard and the War on Terror, Transformation and Opportunity. Andrew Wiest is, is University Distinguished Professor of History and the founding director of the Dale Center for the Study of War and Society at the University of Southern Mississippi. He has served as a visiting professor at both the United States Air Force Air War College and the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. His best-selling book, The Boys of 67, Charlie Company's War in Vietnam, was made into an Emmy-nominated documentary for National Geographic Channel, uh, it, 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 titled Brothers in War. Wiest won the Society for Military History's Distinguished Book Award for his Vietnam's Forgotten Army, Heroism and Betrayal in the ARVN, and a New York Festival's International Gold Medal Award for the documentary Vietnam in HD. He holds a BA and MA from U the University of Southern Mississippi and a PhD from the University of Illinois, Chicago. Kevin Green is Associate Professor of History in the School of Humanities at the University of Southern Mississippi, where he is a fellow at the Dale Center and director of the Center for Oral History and Cultural Heritage. Through the Dale Center, Green is principal investigator for the Mississippi Oral History Project, a research initiative funded by the Mississippi legislature to document Mississippi's culture and history in the 20th and 21st centuries. He is the author of The Invention and Reinvention of Big Bill Brunsey and is published in the Journal of Urban History, the Journal of Southern History, the Journal of American Ethnic History, the Journal of Mississippi History, and the New York Times. Kevin will speak first, then Andy will follow, and uh, then they'll both be available for questions at the end. Before they come up, I, I want to thank our friends in the National Guard who have come to this program today, both those active and retired in particular. I see that uh, retired Major General Harold Cross here, and thanks to Alan McDaniel, who's the director of the National Guard Association of Mississippi. Help me welcome Kevin Green to the stage. Thank you all for coming. It's nice to be back here and participate in another History as Lunch and in something that uh, Andy and I have been working on now with several guardsmen and women in the room for over the past few years, so it's nice to actually come out in and, and this sort of uh, uh, public forum and, and talk to you all about this. Do a little bit of storytelling first about how this project and, and how this work sort started. It was in the summer of 2017, it was the 100th anniversary of the Camp Shelby's uh, founding, and they had their gala. And several members of the Dale Center attended, and we got, you know, we all got dressed up and looked nice, and everybody smelled nice, it was a great event. And we met lots of guardsmen and women, uh, uh, both uh, uh, active now and, and, and retired and former, former service uh, men and women there. And a lot of stories were going around about uh, Camp Shelby, about the guard in Mississippi. And one of the stories that we heard uh, was about a specific National Guard unit that deployed in 2005 um, in a Gulf Coast unit. 
that uh, was facing some pretty difficult times uh, in Iraq, and they were deployed to Iraq, while Hurricane Katrina was destroying their homes uh, back in the United States. And the difficulty that that group experienced and, and, and trying to relate, you know, the, 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 the hard time they were having in Iraq at the moment and also the, trying to translate back to their families uh, back, back in South Mississippi and along the Gulf Coast. And it's a story that sort of stuck with all of us, and it's a story that really struck, uh, stuck with my intrepid uh, colleague over here, Andy, who said, you know what, I really got to dig into this thing. I really want to find out about this particular unit. Well, it comes to find out that, in fact, one of his uh, uh, lifelong friends was a, a member of that unit. And so we started to kind of dig into this story through oral histories and, and, and uh, interviewing the, this. Uh, uh, he's now retired, of course. But interviewing uh, uh, this Mississippi Guardsman about the experience within this unit and about what that was like. And through those oral histories, we discovered a massive transformation that had taken place in the, uh, with the Guard, particularly as it engaged with the global war on terror. And Mississippi stories uh, were embedded all through this particular transformation, and we found it fascinating. So Andy decides, you know, I think I'll start a research project on this. And, and so I'm like, well, how can I help? Maybe I'll help design the oral history component of it. We can dig out some of the archival material. We'll see what's available. And we'll pull it all together. And maybe we can get, you know, a, real, a base for a real good research project going on. But what we found out uh, almost immediately is it's impossible in some ways to write guard history. And that's uh, uh, because of a number of factors. But one of them is in central to the talk we're given today, is that despite the U.S. National Guard's nearly 400-year history of service in every American conflict, it's the one major component of our current and modern armed forces without an active archive and research center. There isn't one. The 54 separate states and territories all have sort of disconnected in some ways and disjointed historical infrastructures. Some, many of them are connected to the National Guard Bureau in Washington, and there are National, uh, 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 National Guard uh, Bureau command historians who are responsible for some of this. Uh, ours is with us today. Captain Murphy is here as uh, Mississippi's command historian, is responsible for Mississippi National Guard history, currently in the state of, Mississi uh, state of Mississippi. And so what we found is that some states with active and strong guard culture like ours uh, there's a pretty good connection of, of uh, some oral histories and some archival material, but in other states, uh, it's a little more disconnected, a little more disjointed. There are some states are doing what they can, like Mississippi, but many states uh, still are, are struggling to try to determine and figure out how to have access to this guard history, especially as it relates to the global war on terror following uh, the September 11th attacks. Roughly 30 out of 54 state, the 54 states and territories in the United States have some form of museum, museum excuse me, highlighting their state territories or, or uh, guard, but most don't have archives. Some, like Massachusetts and our great state of Mississippi, have both museums and work with their state archives to preserve some of this history. But even a state like ours, with an active guard culture, has its data and records spread across the state. Some of it is down the road at MDAH, some of it is at Camp Shelby, some of it is, joint, is at, at the Joint Forces Headquarters here in Jackson, but even more is in the armories and hangars across the state. And in some ways, uh, some of this data and some of this archival material and record folks haven't seen uh, in a really long time. They've been sort of uh, collected but closed uh, off access. Unfortunately, uh, some of the 54 states and territories have only websites devoted to the Guard's history among their particular state and or territory. Even still, in the age of uh, the sort of digital revolution and digital-born data, it's segmented and difficult to access. There are big digital data dumps, for example, at Fort McNair in Washington, D.C., and mining those takes hours and hours of labor to be able to, to access some of the information within those uh, particular data dumps. So that pulls us down to uh, what we think is the fascinating part of this particular work, is that much of the uh, Mississippi National Guard and the United States National Guard lives in each individual state and territory within the specific communities where their units are from. 
And we think this is a really important part of this project is its roots in local communities. And that for me as an oral historian, that's a fascinating opportunity to really move within these communities and start capturing some of this uh, uh, global war on terror and, and the history of, of our participation in that. Current military historical facilities do not adequately tell the story of the National Guard. For example, the, the Center for Military History, or the Center of uh, the United States Army Center of Military History, uh, is responsible in some ways for writing the large picture of the United States National Guard. But as you can imagine, they are busy writing their own active duty history and involved in collecting that history. And to be honest, the Guard is always left in the margins of that particular history. Not to mention, that the Center for Military History is just now completing the official histories of the Vietnam War. So that's about how far back their data, research, and productivity has come in terms of what we're dealing with with these other active duty uh, uh, research centers. As National Guard units demobilize and soldiers are absorbed back into the communities, so are their stories. And much of their experiences, as I mentioned before, live on in local communities. And we've discovered this in the work that we've done just in the past couple of years. We've conducted roughly 30 or 40 oral histories, uh, especially in the South Mississippi region. And these stories are there. And they're alive in places like Meridian and Tupelo and Loosedale, these places with tra strong traditional guard cultures where the guard has played an important part in the fabric of that specific community. And that's just talk, and we've just been focusing on military service here. Let's remember the history of uh, the National Guard domestic response you could argue is, is not even captured as effectively as the National Guard uh, uh, response to the global war on terror. So for example, the Center for Oral History uh, following Hurricane Katrina disaster conducted a massive oral history project uh, uh, and guardsmen and women from across the country and across Mississippi are everywhere in those oral histories. And there are 400 of them. And I would dare say that maybe 150 at some point mention the importance, the impact, the influence, the presence of guard, guardsmen and women in that particular uh, uh, natural disaster. And the guard responds not only to both natural and man-made disasters, but they help, help implement public health initiatives and face social and community unrest. And you could make the argument that the history of their service is as complex as any service to the country at, at any level of the United States federal government. The truth is we are losing these stories at an alarming rate as soldiers and airmen and women and family members are lost or move on. Some of the commanding generation of the folks, uh, the, the commanding officers of the, the 05 deployment have now retired from, the, many have now retired from the Guard and have moved on and are moving in through their 60s and into their 70s and their memories carry on uh, with them and it's important to, to document those as well. Our plan, and I'm going to stop here and let Andy uh, uh, tell you some really good history, our plan and why we're here today is to begin discussing publicly about standing up a center that can help write this type, correct and write this type of history by capturing and chronicling the documents and oral histories of the Guard in Mississippi. We're lucky in Mississippi in that we have a great Department of Archives and History that has started to do some of this, that the Joint Forces Headquarters in Jackson has, has collected uh, some of this material, that we have military history programs in, in, uh, across uh, our state, and especially at Southern Miss, I'll brag a little bit, that are interested in capturing this history, but other states are not that fortunate. So what we're proposing here, what we want to talk, start talking about is how we can do this first for Mississippi to, to, to create a national model that we can then share with the other 54 to one day develop a national research center for the National Guard. It's the oldest service branch and it's long overdue. And we wanna make this uh, material available publicly for researchers and students and teachers. If we tell their stories and we dive deep into research and, and, and sharing these remarkable men and women, their histories, come help, their histories come alive and help our communities thrive, and in some ways give back to the communities uh, that they have helped secure and, and make so uh, wonderful here in the state of Mississippi. So I'm gonna hand over to Andy, and he's gonna tell you some stories about some of these communities.
Uh, if y'all don't mind, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read mine, because if you ask my wife, I can talk about this stuff for hours and hours and hours if I'm allowed to go just off the cuff. What I hope to do here with my time is to give you a glimpse of the type of stories that can be found hidden in these guard documents, the type of stories that once there is an archive to study the guard uh, can be found from all over the country. Uh, the focus of my research is the 150th Engineer Battalion and its deployment to Iraq in 2005. In 2005, Operation Iraqi Freedom had hit a snag. The invasion of 2003 had toppled Saddam Hussein with relative ease, but as you're probably aware, the country pretty quickly dissolved into an insurgency plus a civil war. The unrest had reached its peak with the Marine struggle in Fallujah in December of 2004, and guard units were called up from across the nation to help stem the tide in Iraq. The 150th parent unit, the 155 Armored Brigade, was tasked with owning an area in South Anbar Province and Northern Babel Province in Iraq, just south of Baghdad. Within that mandate, as combat engineers, it was gonna to fall to the 150th to construct and maintain the forward operating bases that the 155th would occupy. One worry from the very beginning was that the 150th lacked up armored vehicles. In Kuwait, once they'd gotten there, the Mississippians scrounged to transform whatever scrap metal they'd brought with them and could find into what they called hillbilly armor and welded it onto their Humvees and M113s. Even as a Tennessee guardsman, th this made the newspapers, a Tennessee guardsman uh, famously groused to Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld about the situation, and Rumsfeld's response was, you go to war with the army you have. The Mississippians were under the overall command of the U.S. Marines, who owned Anbar Province. And the Marines had a force level problem. In the wake of the Battle of Fallujah in the fall of 2004, Anbar had blown up into widespread fighting and the Marines needed help. Thus it was that the request went down to the Mississippians that they needed to take more territory. And the only unit ready to hand was the 150th. Turned out the 150th wasn't going to be combat engineers. Instead, they were going to receive their own area of operations, 15 miles outside of Baghdad, hard on the Euphrates River, near a decrepit forward operating base called Dogwood. Dogwood was an ex-military base in the middle of the desert, essentially by this time a couple of run-down looted buildings that were presently, when they pulled in, uh, being occupied by U.S. cavalry forces just as a stopgap measure. So the Mississippians set out to Dogwood, a place they didn't know, to do a job they had not expected. Little did the 150th know, but they were headed into an area of South Anbar known as the Triangle of Death. The desert that they would occupy was the prime location chosen by Saddam's troops to bury weaponry as Baghdad had fallen in 2003. Thus it was the insurgency's armory. The buried weapons were dug up out of the desert and spirited to the nearby Euphrates River at a village called Oasat to be transshipped along that river to insurgents countrywide. Making matters worse, the Marine Offensive in Fallujah in the previous fall had forced insurgents from that city and they'd fanned out in the countryside, most of them landing in Oasat, now owned by the 150th. So the 150th was thrown unaware into the teeth of the Iraqi insurgency. On their first few ride-alongs with the cavalry unit that was occupying the FOB, the Mississippians were stunned by the frequency of IED and mortar attacks, and the cavalry was obviously very happy to be leaving. The cav troopers asked the Mississippians when their tanks would be arriving, and when they found out the Mississippians had neither tanks nor fully up-armored vehicles, the cav, troop, cav troopers told them, good luck, you're damn well going to need it. The 150th year at Dogwood has so much I could talk about, but I'm going to stick to the tactical here. On the second day of owning the FOB, Sean Cooley led a patrol, a morning patrol of Bravo companies, Humvees and 113s. The idea was to get the lay of the land, see what they landed in, to figure out where the hell they were, and maybe push the insurgents a little bit more out of mortar range from the base. The patrol departed through a cut in the berm that the Iraqi army had long ago cut when it was their base, and the patrol went without incident. Cooley was not supposed to go on the second patrol, but he thought the experience he'd already gained would be helpful, so he took over as a driver of one of the Humvees. The patrol departed through the same cut in the berm. As they moved through the cut, 
Hooley's Humvee hit an IED, a 155mm artillery round that went off directly under the driver's seat, instantly killing Cooley. Uh, if you know anything about Sean Cooley, if you've heard of him before, he was the lifeblood of the unit, and losing him so quickly caused an anguish and a desire for revenge among the men. The commander of the 150th, uh, Colonel Roy Robinson, gathered the men and quickly set them straight. He knew that his men were hurting because the National Guard's a family, if you know how they train and operate. But he also knew that not every Iraqi was an insurgent, that treating the Iraqi people poorly would simply create more insurgents. He told his men he had, that they had to work with the Iraqi people, not against them. But Robinson also faced a tactical problem. He needed armored vehicles. So he swapped a platoon of his engineers for a platoon of cavalry tanks. And he also called in a combat psychiatrist. In the first few months at Dogwood, things settled down into an uncomfortable rhythm. Patrols digging up arms caches, getting struck by IEDs, and hit by mortars. And everybody knew what the problem was. It was that insurgent-dominated village of Oasat. So the 150th ran constant raids on the village, but none of those solved the problem. The Mississippians had to approach Oasat across an open desert, kilometers of open desert, and they were always spotted in time for the insurgents to jump in boats, get across the Euphrates, and get to another uh, outfit's AO and reach safety. So by the time the 150th patrols arrived, there was nothing but women and children in that village of Oasat, and they had no knowledge at all of anybody who were insurgents. The situation was massively frustrating for Robinson. He knew how those insurgents were escaping, but he wasn't allowed to open fire on the men swimming and boating across the river. So the drumbeat of war went on, with IEDs wounding several more of the 150th with two losing legs, but there were no further deaths until June. In June, the M113 carrying Larry Arnold, Terrence Lee, an interpreter who everybody loved and called Ron, hit a massive IED right outside Oasat. Two 115 shells attached to a pressure plate. The M113 had its hillbilly armor, the armor that had been welded onto it, but the weld gave way, forcing the armor up and crushing Arnold, Lee, and Ron in the back of the vehicle. Who they were is a guard story. Larry Arnold had been in, the, in a guard transport unit in Operation Desert Storm, and he didn't need to go to Iraq again, but he had volunteered so he can go with his son. His son was away on R&R, &R, and Larry that day had taken his son's place in the 113. Terrence Arnold had joined the guard because a poor black man in trouble with the law didn't have many other choices where he lived. Uh, he also was married to Stephanie. Uh, she was also a guard member, but she had been discharged due to a training accident. She was home expecting the couple's first child, which she had exactly when Katrina hit their house uh, a couple months after his death. And for the Iraqi interpreter, Ron, who was only 17 years old, he lied about his age to become an interpreter. He wanted nothing more to, than to become an American, and he dreamed about going to an American college, and the unit was raising money to send him to college. Uh, sadly enough, when Ron's parents were informed that he had died, they refused to accept his body because he died serving with the Americans. But this time, Colonel Robinson had enough. Something had to change in Oasat. But there's still the problem of crossing the desert and the bad guys easily escaping. So a unit full of, remember, because National Guardsmen all have other jobs, right? So a unit that's full of construction workers, cops, road pavers, and country boys came up with a very unique country boy solution to the whole problem. There was one road running through Oasad, a road that hugged the river. It was a dike road built up, built up off the ground. Two bulldozers cut it, 30-foot gaps in the road on one side of town and on the other, leaving it fully impassable. That was the first idea. Second idea, build them a new road. This one on the Americans' side of town. Uh, this road is going to be concrete, leaving it much harder to put IEDs on. And the contractors who are going to build it were going to be the local Iraqis themselves. Somebody was paying them. So how about we pay them instead? Maybe we can, you know, not only can we keep an eye on them while they're working, uh, maybe uh, it doesn't hurt if we're the ones paying them and not the bad guys. So now all traffic into and out of Oasat came on the American side of Dogwood, but there was still a problem. Dogwood itself was still three kilometers away, so it was very difficult to keep an eye on all this traffic. So the third idea was seize the outmost 
building in the village and converted into a forward outpost, continuously manned by a U.S. platoon. This outpost became known as Dogpatch. Now all traffic was closely monitored along a concrete road as the locals worked nearby under constant surveillance. And the next idea was that the Americans settled down into a very predictable troop rotation. They'd come in at a certain time of night and feed the troops, come in at a certain time of the day and rotate troops out. This lulled the insurgents to sleep. They, they got used to the American rotation, knew when and when and how the Americans were doing things. Well, on the third week, when the habitual food trucks arrived at Dog Patch, they weren't carrying food. They were carrying two additional platoons of men who snuck into Dog Patch unseen. At 3 a.m., these three platoons raided OSI unannounced with choppers circling overhead. And that night, because they got there before the insurgents knew they were there, they captured 150 of them and actually were able to open fire on the people trying to swim the river, and many of them were killed. In one raid, the 150th that crushed the insurgency in Oasat using pure improvisation. There were more such raids in the following weeks. The next one netted 34 insurgents, and the number kept going down and down and down. It was in the middle of these operations that Katrina struck, and as you might suspect, that was a unique situation for the Mississippians. Uh, the, the families at home were used to wondering about whether their uh, husbands and wives in Iraq were safe. The husbands and wives in Iraq were hardly used to worrying about whether the families at home were safe. And as it turns out, given where most of these uh, men came from, many of their homes were destroyed, which of course left uh, the unit with a, a nightmare of compassionate leave to send men home to repair their homes. Uh, so that uh, was a particular logistical nightmare for Colonel Robinson and his men. Uh, some, some men never made it home by the time they went uh, home permanently uh, in December. Back in Iraq in late September, there was an unexpected visit at the gates of Dogwood. Three Arab sheiks were approaching the gate on foot carrying a white flag. As it turned out, these were the elders of the Oasat tribe uh, who dominated Oasat village. And they came with good news and a complaint. The good news they carried was that the insurgents, who they said were largely foreign fighters from Al-Qaeda, who had been holding Oasad hostage, well, they left the village and relocated to a place that wasn't so hard to survive in further north. So they told the Americans Oasad was free. Their complaint was that the traffic measures and the tight control over the town had essentially cut all economic activity in the village and the people were in tough shape. Robinson countered, that he'd help them out, but he wanted no more IED and mortar attacks. So they're all sitting there drinking southern iced tea, which the sheiks dutifully drank, but they didn't seem to like at all. And they cooked up a bargain. The sheiks promised to keep the violence at bay and the insurgents gone, and the Americans would help them rebuild their economy. For the next months, the Mississippians and the population of Oasat worked hand in glove. Weekly meetings ensued. Uh, with the sheiks to discuss any residual violence in the area and what the people needed economically. The only bone of contention was who was going to bring the tea. They hated our tea, we hated theirs. So the 150th adopted Oasat and undertook a number of public works projects to better the lives of the people who were living there. With many of the Mississippi, with many Mississippi farmers among the guardsmen and women, uh, working to help the farmers in the delta along the Euphrates was second nature and involved using U.S. equipment to dig or clear old irrigation ditches and canals. The Mississippians also had better seed to provide them with, um, uh, especially wheat, and they taught the Iraqis much better animal husbandry. Uh, one of the funny stories I ran across was the tending of livestock was especially fun for some Mississippi ranchers, but they all, always fell afoul of one goat that they considered to be crazy that would always chase them and somehow had the ability to shoot poop at them, which I still don't quite know uh, how that happened. Mississippi troops also adopted the local school and the local orphanage, providing water systems for both and hooking them both up to the electrical grid. And the Mississippians began to hand out largesse to the children especially. Uh, uh, not so much candy, but the, the, the most sought after thing the Mississippians would, would give them was soccer balls. Only problem is the sometimes the children would line up twice and the adults would try to take it, so that there were some problems along those lines. One of the most touching stories I found along these lines 
was that Alpha Company, the 150th, discovered a child named Muhammad who had no genitals and had a bladder that was growing outside of his body. After being shown the child's conditions by his father, the Mississippians first wondered whether he'd been wounded, but it turned out it was a, it was a birth defect. Uh, Alpha Company adopted the child and had money raised, and they sent him to Baghdad to, for U.S. military surgery to repair his bladder, so they got that done. Their next step was to make com, uh, contacts in America for a much, um, a much more complicated gender identity surgery. And to this day, it's been one of the things I've been unable to find out whether that actually happened. So if you know anybody from Alpha Company who knows whether or not Muhammad made it to the States, I'd love to know that. Uh, finally, the Mississippians ran what is known as MedCap missions, in which battalion doctors brought Western medical care to the civilians. The doctors were welcomed, but the civilians hated the dentist because uh, dental hygiene was so bad in the area that the dentists usually pulled teeth, and they didn't like that at all, but they put up with it. So without adequate intelligence, without proper weaponry, and on a base that occupied the very end of the U.S. logistical string, the 150th had improvised with great success. What had once been a no-go area in the middle of the Triangle of Death was now completely pacified with locals in the 150th becoming fast friends. When it came time for the Mississippians to head home in December, they were proud to pass on the notes of their success to the incoming Marines who would hold dogwood. Each company commander passed on a folder of information to the incoming counterpart and stood ready to show them the ropes, especially with the sheiks and the whole tea thing going on and warn him about the goat. But the Marines weren't having any of it. They weren't there for pacification or school building. They were there to kick ass and take names. Indeed, they didn't even think dogwood itself was worth the time and they informed the Mississippians that dogwood was going to be closed down. Shocked guard commanders argued against the Marine ideas but couldn't be, Marines couldn't be moved. And Dogwood itself had progressed from a scratch in the desert to a full-blown American base. It had everything on it by this time. Everything, beds, air conditioners, TVs, a PX, I mean, you name it, it's all there. And now the Marines are gonna destroy it all. Many of the Mississippians asked, should some of the more useful items like beds or whatnot be distributed to the local Iraqi population? But the Marines refused to do that and destroyed it all while the last Mississippians were there to watch. The troops of the 150th arrived back at Camp Shelby in dribs and drabs in December of 2005, uh, met by family and friends. Most of them remained in the guard. Uh, it's a post-war part of this story that I won't talk about here, uh, but, but many of them go on to, to many, many other uh, deployments overseas as well. The 150th itself is deployed six times. Uh, during, uh, actually, the Bravo out of Loosedale is deployed six times. Sadly, what the Mississippi Guard did and the other five, four other Guard brigades in 2005, has, as Kevin mentioned, has just disappeared from history. Um, I, I called up the Marines' history of Ambar Province in 2005. doesn't mention the Guard at all. You, you can't find oh, the village of Oasat in it. If you look for writing on the Guard in this deployment or any of its other many deployments, all you'll find is a few uh, quotes from Army sources saying the Guard didn't do a very good job. That's all you'll find. Uh, these actions only solidify a already standing mistrust between the Guard and the regular Army. Regardless what the Army had thought of them, the Guard was needed again. And as I mentioned, um, the unit from Loosedale has been to Iraq, Afghanistan, and to Kuwait twice since then. While the Guard occupies, well, I'll just skip that part because Kevin's going to bring it up in a second. But the lack of uh, recognition is galling to Guardsmen. It was a much more personal story uh, that came to haunt some of them a little bit after the war. Uh, as you might suspect, 150th members began to pay a little attention on the news to see if they ever saw their little slice of Iraq. Uh, the first major news story to arise out of this area was about General David Petraeus and the Anbar Awakening. Uh, I'm already running out of time, but let me tell you, everything that General David Petraeus wrote into the counterinsurgency manual, the manual about how to fight these wars, the Mississippians had done it before he wrote it and before he talked about it. Uh, many of the things that are classical counterinsurgency uh, that happened in Anbar that he based his career on, uh, the Mississippians largely started. The specific thing that bothered Mississippians when they read the news was 
one thing most of them don't know, and I'm sorry if I'm uh, laying on this uh, some of y'all today, but I discovered in my research that the Mississippians had job their, done their job so well that even after the Marines abandoned the uh, dogwood, the residents of Oasot de decided they wanted change too. They raised their own little militia force of 200 men to try to keep Al-Qaeda out. Uh, Al-Qaeda wiped out those 200 men and took over the village again uh, less than a year after the Mississippians left. Oasat once again became a hotbed of insurgency and wasn't in the news again until 2009 when two U.S. soldiers were captured nearby and they were taken to Oasat to be killed. Uh, the army was now tasked with revenge and there was a pretty big battle raised in Oasat in 2009. Didn't register much with the public, but it certainly registered with the Mississippians who'd been there. After the battle, in which the U.S. only suffered a few wounded, there was a television report. And in that report, you see three sheiks come walk out of that village asking to parlay with the American forces. The gushing army reporter who's giving this report tells the audiences this was the first time ever that U.S. forces had set foot in Oasat and that the sheiks were so happy to meet Americans for the first time. Mississippians, of course, couldn't help but notice these were the same three sheiks they'd been meeting with and living with for months and had shared tea with on so many occasions. And in the background, they could see the school and the orphanage that, they had re been, that they'd rebuilt. And of course, they'd sadly been destroyed. As I continued to conduct my research, I was uh, lucky enough to uh, in, uh, uh, interview one of the Iraqi interpreters. Uh, he told me that, because I was wanting to interview somebody from Oasat. He said the population there now is not the population that was there then because Al-Qaeda ran it for a while. Then ISIS came and overthrew it from Al-Qaeda. And pretty much he said anybody who remembers anything from 2005 is dead and gone. So here we have just the story of one Mississippi battalion. And rest assured, there's way much more to this story than I gave you just now. But take this story and add to it, multiply it by what the 155th was doing at fire bases all along the area during 2005, add four more brigar, uh, guard brigades to it that were deployed in 2005, and you'll see that there are countless stories of what the guard did, even in, the just, in just that one deployment, countless stories of the guard's bravery and sacrifice during that year. And add to that all the other deployments to Iraq, Afghanistan, and Kuwait. Add to that all the peacetime deployments of storm rescue and COVID relief. Add all these up and you can see that both the quality and quantity of National Guard stories out there that need to be told. And this is just one very tiny one. We won't really know the history of the U.S. Armed Forces until the National Guard is added to that story. And found in the archive that we're talking about is only going to be able to help us move in that direction. So now I'm going to tag Kevin back in. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Andy. Uh, bear with me. A historian is going to throw out some numbers here, so I apologize. Um, but it's in, an, in its initial five-plus years, almost six years, of the global war on terror from September 11, 2001 to summer of 2007, about 1.5 million U.S. troops were deployed to the, to the global war uh, uh, on terror's two principal theaters, Afghanistan and Iraq. Of that number, about 1.3 were members of the active duty armed forces, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and the Marines, and their respective reserve units. The remaining 245,000 were members of the National Guard, including the Army National Guard and the Air National Guard. And of that nearly uh, uh, 250,000, almost 55,000 were deployed more than once. So between September 11, 2001 and June 30th, 30th 2007, Upwards of a quarter of a million members of the United States National Guard served either in Afghanistan or Iraq. As you can tell from the stories that Andy is sharing with you, that is a ton of history for historians. A, a, a broad gamut of history for us to capture and interpret. If we do it correctly, these efforts can be used to set planning paradigms for future wars and remember and learn from the efforts of those services in, in past conflicts. And we can also learn, more importantly, what makes the Guard so unique and important to our communities and to our cultures, and why it's such in need of serious study.
But if we do it poorly, as we did with the case in the Vietnam generation, we'll miss yet another opportunity to learn from our military and our country's past. The Army and the Navy and the Air Force and the Marines all have research centers and archives devoted to collecting and telling their stories. And these result in outreach and educational programs, including, as Andy was talking about, the publication of official histories. There's the U.S. Army Center of Military History in Washington, D.C. at Fort McNair. There's the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. There's the Air Force Historical Research Agency at Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama. And there's the Marine Corps History Division in Quantico, Virginia. And the Navy and History and Heritage Command in the Washington Naval Yard in Washington, D.C. But sadly, as you can tell from this talk, the Guard doesn't have one. And leaving its story all too often ignored, scattered, underrepresented, misinterpreted, or forgotten. Our plan is to help make Mississippi a model for the 54 states and territories, to begin thinking about how to do this, how to capture, identify, chronicle, interview, archive this material, so that one day perhaps a national center for the National Guard can exist, uh, and it will be filled with all of these great materials and stories that should be told and need to be told. We've started capturing uh, um, dozens of boxes of unit files from Joint Forces Headquarters here in Jackson. We're digitally capturing some, some unit files that are just uh, pretty simple and, and, and uh, uh, basic information. And we've collected about, uh, uh, over the past 15 years or so, about six dozen oral histories with members of the 150 and the 155. But I want to be clear, um, it's not just a two-person show. We've been, we, over the past few years, we've had lots of conversations about this. Uh, it's, it's a collaborative effort and has been. Of course, the University of Southern Mississippi has been very supportive. And as representatives of the Dale Center and the Center for Oral History, we have been sort of driving this as well. But we've developed close relationships uh, with the National Guard Bureau, with the Mississippi National Guard, with the National Guard Association of the United States, the United States Army uh, Center of Military History, Camp, and Camp Shelby uh, Joint Forces Training Center uh, here in Mississippi. And we hope to continue this work. And so that part of our, our presentation today was to kind of present what we've been up to and really the importance of, uh, of starting a conversation and, and developing stakeholders and relationships that will allow us to envision and perhaps one day create and set up a center that can archive and, and hold and, and tell these wonderful stories of our National Guard men and women. And so with that, uh, we'll take questions. I think uh, Chris will go around the room if you do have a question, and, and we'll have uh, a microphone for you. Uh, actually, before Chris does that, can I ask a favor? Can uh, any present or past members of the National Guard please stand for uh, some recognition? If you have a question, you can just raise your hand. We'll bring the mic to you. There, I'll slide over. Okay. Good evening, gentlemen. <clears throat> My name is retired Staff Sergeant Thomas Cheatham. I served 32 years in the military. I served four years on active duty, uh, 28 years in the National Guard, 323rd Aviation Group. You know, I think that every boy, 18 years old or older, need to be serving our military. I tell you, so much that they offer. Military offers so much that these boys, I'm not talking about the girls, I'm talking about the boys, that uh, they can get when they get out of the military. I went down to Gulfport and, and I went into the facilities. Uh, I was surprised to see how many civilians was working for the uh, military rather than the retirees. So if we had uh, more of a 18 years and older, you'll see a different, different country. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just wondering about the National Guard Bureau Chief and um, uh, how he, uh, ha I'm sure he knows your efforts and how he may be pitching it to, um, you know, he's in a maze in the Pentagon. I've been in his office or the 
past one. And I'm just wondering the interplay, and could you feed me and the others a little more information about the NGB chief and how he may be helping in the process? Uh, uh, I'll start with a story. Go for it. So start with a story. We, we, uh, uh, Richard Clark is the chief historian at, the, at NGB, and uh, we've gotten to know him pretty well over the, the past few years. We were all excited. We got our first meeting with Dr. Clark, and we, we had this presentation laid out, and we're like, Dr. Clark, we have a really good idea, and we've, we've been looking through this over the past few years, and we've developed some things that we want to talk to you about. And before we could even get into our PowerPoint briefing, he basically told us what the problems are, right? That there is no sort of infrastructure to capture this in, every 50, in the 54, that command historians often work within specific states and territories, but then they advance and move out of those positions. Or, so for example, we met a command historian who's responsible for Maine, I think, but because there were no command historians in Vermont, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, he was basically covering most of New England as one historian. So as we were prepared to give him our briefing about what we were up to and the, the excitement of doing this work, we didn't even give it to him because he laid out all of our talking points from the beginning of the conversation. So we've, we've, we've talked with them many times. Um, yeah, we're, we're in discussions uh, with them right now about how we can best serve the guard and you know, what, 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 what they need from us. And they've been e extremely helpful and you know, we're, um, uh, Richard has been nothing but uh, supportive of the efforts. and. And he's been a, a fount of wisdom about you know, how to reach out to the other 53. And so um, that's going to be a, a big part of the job if we, if we do succeed in taking this national will be the, uh, the, the relationship with the, all the other states. And uh, it's a military bureaucracy is not something we were familiar with. We're, we're familiar with the university bureaucracy, but they have some things in common, as it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> As I'm walking over, I'm going to pass along a comment from the live stream where one viewer said, this, is need, this needs to be a movie. All right. So um, I'm Pat Moraine, and um, I'm retired from uh, Jackson State University, but um, I was in the Department of Communication. And um, specifically, we talked about oral history because oral history is very, very, very accurate it is the most accurate uh, process that you can approach to understanding history. So I'm so glad that you took that approach to understanding the National Guard. Um, and I'm also glad that you talked about the end result. The end result is interpretation and problem solving. So we won't understand the problems until we talk to the people who actually had the problems and solve those problems, and then we can advance. So thank you so much for yeah, all that welcome. you have done. I appreciate the approach, and I appreciate the I'll work. Go ahead. The, uh, the, the oral histories are so, are so key to us. I mean, um, you know, I'm, I'm writing a book about the 150th. Uh, uh, I, I write books about units in, in, in war, and the only way really to get down to what happens. You can't fight what happens in a piece of paper that said we were at objective X. You, you got to talk to the person who is there. So it provides the soul that, that that history desperately needs. But also as historians, in the, the, the present world we find ourselves in, uh, I used to write about World War I. And everybody wrote everything down in World War I. It's a, it's a historian's paradise. But it's now so much communication is done electronically that the, the, the source base is just simply not as rich. And we're lucky that the vast majority of the people who served in this, uh, in this deployment and in the later deployments are still around to talk to. And, that, and that's the, the only way to really get today's story, uh, especially with things. Uh, you don't write letters home anymore. You, you send an email or you talk on FaceTime or something. And so letters and journals just really don't exist like they used to in the past. So oral history is how you fill that gap. Absolutely. And given the nature of 
uh, this research, uh, specifically for you know, academic historians or, or even folks outside of the academy as well, you often corroborate a bunch of evidence together, um, whether it be these types of materials. Uh, and, and some of the global war on terror data that's been generated has been digital, and it's not easy to access. Some of it is, is classified and controlled from the start, so it, uh, folks like Andy and I can't really read it anyway. One of the only angles or one of the only approaches to this research is to conduct oral histories because the oral histories, you know, you just move into the, these communities, you start making relationships and, and, and building those types of rapport. And um, it really is one of the only ways at, at present. And that's one of the problems we've identified is that oral histories are going to have to be a major component of it. And it's one thing that the National Guard Bureau chief historian is really excited about because he under he recognized that problem too. And so they're really excited about the opportunity, not only for us to uncover these oral histories, but also to develop uh, uh, training programs for National Guard Bureau historians uh, uh, and field historians to learn oral history techniques, get into their communities and, and into their states and territories and start conducting some of these projects. Uh, one other angle on that, the, uh, the, the, the National Guard as a community organization, so much of it is not a deployment. So much of it is families and their place in the community. And you're, you're not going to find a, a family's recollection of what the deployment was like in military records. You're not going to find what the Guard means to a community unless you speak with the people from that community. So oral history is key to getting the other side of the story as well. Um, I'm wondering, as great historians, if you have an interpretation as to why the 150th went about their work in Iraq differently than the Marines. And I wonder if that experience of being rooted in a community before they went over may have played a part. It was a part of my little paper that I didn't read because I was running out of time. But um, the guy who co-wrote the counterinsurgency manual with David Petraeus is a guy named John Noggle, who, who I'm reasonably close with. And, and I asked Noggle, if, if you, what would be your number one counterinsurgent unit? And he said the guard. Because, you know, where soldiers are full-time soldiers, that's their job, that's their, that's what they know. Guardsmen bring so many other uh, skills to the table. Uh, so many skills other than their, their kinetic skill. And uh, uh, the Guard is uniquely suited for that, for thinking outside the box, because they spend a lot of their time outside the military box. And, and uh, I, I didn't ask him straight up, did the counterinsurgency manual come from the one, what the 150th did in Anbar? I doubt he would have answered that. <laughs> but, but, but he left it pretty clear that uh, the, if, if he had to pick a unit to do counterinsurgency, it would be a, it would be a National Guard unit. And just following up on that, as a civil rights movement veteran and a protester against the Vietnam War, I am glad that you told the that part of the story that you did. I think that one of the challenges today is that the ROTC programs I've heard about are wonderful programs for children, but being in the military context, the Marines context, as you, as it were, as distinct from the National Guard model context, is something that is not, is not helpful. We need to have those programs available to all children and not because they're related to the military. And I'll, I'll, I'll hasten to add, the Marines aren't bad at this. The Marines, are, they're, their history has been one of small unit wars, especially prior to, 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 to Vietnam. But it's, it doesn't come as naturally to a force that is of their nature. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the general who led the 3rd Infantry Division into Baghdad, General Buford Blunt, uh, uh, lives in Hattiesburg. And after his men took Baghdad, they proved to be good at this kind of stuff as well. It just it was a second thought for them, quite often not the first one. Um. Other questions? All right. Let me make one observation, if I could, uh, on the uh, 155th and their performance over there. 
uh, they fell in under the 3rd Marine Expeditionary Forces, commanded by General Johnson, two-star, uh, who was actually equivalent to a division commander over there then. Marine, of course, uh, most of you know the Marine Corps has got 187,000 people on active duty. The National Guard, uh, Army National Guard, uh, exceeds that in numbers. So they have a different doctrine also to fight. Uh, but I visited General Johnson three times over there. And uh, he commented to me that uh, uh, anywhere, anytime, any place, under any conditions, he would fight with the 155th worldwide. Had all the respect in the world for him. Uh, some of these uh, stories uh, become amplified, some become uh, subverted down, some become distorted uh, from time to time, but that's the nature of history. It's always interpretive. Uh, but I can tell you, though, that uh, there was no finer history than what the 155th laid down uh, in Al Anbar province, the Triangle of Death. And by the way, uh, you mentioned David Petraeus. Uh, he will confirm this to you, that all of a sudden, in Al Anbar province, there was a breathtaking transformation uh, because the tribesmen, the local people, finally rose up against the al-Qaeda, against the... Uh, uh, people that were polluting their populations uh, with different ideology than they were signing on to. And that made all the difference in the world. One other observation, uh, Marine versus National Guard. Uh, National Guard is a community-based defense force. Most of these young soldiers enlist. They stay in that career for their lifetime. Many of them in the same MOS, Military Operations Specialist. So when you go into a combat situation, uh, your first sergeant's probably 50 years old, or 45, or maybe 35 or 40, but with a lot of years of experience and knows everyone personally, and knows your families, and knows uh, what the talents of each one of his soldiers are. You don't find that in active duty. You don't find it in the Marine Corps whose uh, soldiers, may, uh, their, their Marines, normally transfer in and out within three or four years to a different specialty or to a different uh, even unit. But there's a great, great camaraderie there. Uh, in, in closing, let me just mention one little uh, thing. The culture is different in the National Guard. I recall uh, back in history, I won't delve in this too much, you learned historians are far more astute than me. But Private Brantley, uh, the North Carolina militia, American Revolution. Remember, our first muster was 1636. Uh, theirs was with the Continental Army in Boston under General Washington. So a lot of different culture existed there. But uh, just before one of the Revolutionary War battles, uh, there was a North Carolina militia unit raised in a little hell down in one of the valleys. General Washington, with his staff, was riding alongside to look at his troops prior to that battle. And he passed by that ragtag militia unit. Some of his staff were a little irritated about their discipline. <clears throat> and as he rode by, uh, Private Brantley yelled out, General Washington, why not have a cup of wine with us? He mentioned, well, looks like y'all had a little too much wine already. <laughs> So he turned to ride off. And Private Brantley, now keep in mind, he's a private, North Carolina militia, said, damn your lofty soul, General Washington, if you won't have a cup of wine with the people who are fixing to fight for you, leave us. And General Washington uh, swung his horse around. And most of his staff uh, commented in their diaries he thought he was going to inflict discipline on that soldier. And he said, well, I guess we do have time for a sip of wine. <laughs> so he stepped down from his horse, and they had a few cups of wine. Then mounted his horse to ride on. Private Brantley yelled again, General Washington, he flips back around, damn if we won't pour out every drop of blood in our hearts for you today because you've had a sip of wine with us. That's the nature of the militia. They'll fight for you, they'll win for you. You can't go to war without them, but sometimes you're misunderstood. Sometimes they're misinterpreted. 
I'm not saying the 155th was in Iraq. I am a little chagrined they don't appear in some of the historical documentaries uh, and documented history that's supposed to be called official. I'm a little hurt about that. But they know what they did. I know what they did. The Army knows what they did. The Army knows they can't go to war without them. It takes 51 combat brigade combat teams to fight a two MRC uh, a war, two simultaneous wars, and keep enough people around. There's 30, I believe 31 active, 29 National Guard. All the active ones, uh, 18 of those at least are C1, most all of them are C1 or C2. They keep the National Guard C3, C4 combat ready because of some other things that go on budgetarily, uh, finite resources. They don't get physicals every year like they should. They don't get the same attention in peacetime that they should. That's the history of this country if you look back on it. But uh, never has a war been won without them. And they'll always be there for you. God bless all of you guys in the National Guard that, uh, that uh, fought and won wars for the United States. Thank you all for your efforts. I'd like to talk with you too. Sure. Thank you, sir. All right. To Thank me you that, all uh, for being here today. Do you all have any final words? Just going to say to me that family nature of the Guard is, is key. And, uh, and you, you brought up so eloquently the reason that this Guard Center needs to happen so these stories can be, can be told. But I was over in Britain this summer giving a paper on this same topic. And they needed a lot more tutelage about what the National Guard was because they'd never heard of it. And so I kind of explained the guard's history a little bit and kind of the nature of the unit it was. And by the end of it, they were going, that's a great idea. We need units like that. Uh, so it's, it's the, the, the National Guard is special. And the fact that um, I, I serve on the Department of the Army's Historical Advisory Committee, the one that reads those official histories that he was talking about. And the last official history I read on the Vietnam War, they're up to 1965, so they're really moving fast. <laughs> was a thousand pages. It was a thousand pages and it was on the U.S. advisory effort in 65. 65 was a kind of a small year for the Vietnam where we hadn't had many troops over there yet. A thousand pages on part of one year. And then I said, what do you have on the Guard? So they sent me their book on the Guard that they were very proud of. It covered the entire history of the National Guard in 47 pages. And I'm like, no, that, that doesn't cut it. So we, we, we hope to change that. Thank you all for being here today. Um, remember our job fair for uh, volunteer fair tomorrow, the movie screening this weekend here in conjunction with the Green Book. I hope that you'll come back next week when Ben Rains will be our History's Lunch speaker talking about the last slave ship, the Clotilda. But for now, help me thank Andy Wiest and Kevin Green for this fabulous program today.